development programs, policies and projects. So it is a coordinating role. And in the coordinating role, remember there's the parliamentary department, parliamentary and legislative affairs department, where again, uh, the office of the prime cabinet secretary is supposed to coordinate um, uh, the legislative agenda of all government departments yes. uh, in conjunction with the attorney general and the respective ministries. But in practical terms, coordinating uh, government, what exactly does that entail? What do you do? Well, you see, first of all, a government has got several departments. And uh, coordination means coherence, sharing information, making sure that there is a concerted effort to have what you'd call uh, a coordinated approach mm -hmm. to various challenges so that people are not working in isolation uh, or working in silos. So coordination becomes absolutely critical so that uh, we, we want to achieve a situation where the left hand knows and understands what the right hand is doing and why, mm -hmm. okay? So this becomes the, the issue when we are talking about coordination. coordination. So, so how do you do that? Is it through the cabinet secretaries? Is it through the principal secretaries? Um, I want to understand it from the practical side. At, at both levels, actually, at yeah. both levels. Uh, in, this, in, in, in the office of the PCS, there's the national uh, according to the executive order number two, there's the National uh, Government Coordinating Secretariat, Coordination Secretariat. Now, within this framework, uh, then we are able to interact with all the departments okay. of, of government and all ministries. So at some level, you talk to the cabinet secretaries, uh, but the primary instrument of uh, coordinating is really the entity that you call the NDIC. This is the committee of PSS, which I chair, okay? Now, it's at that level that, uh, because the PSS are really the technical arm of the ministries, right. then we engage more robustly uh, with them. How often does that happen? Uh, quarterly. Quarterly, yes. every three months? Yes, every three months. So you assist, according to the executive order, mm -hmm. uh, number one, but also number two, of 2023, you assist the president and the deputy. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the role of a prime minister. Well, uh, the title they have given this office is prime cabinet secretary. But I do agree with you. There's a, there's a very serious debate, uh, uh, and I think it's now in the public domain, mm -hmm. that uh, even within the conversation that was taking place at Bomas, uh, the, the, the feeling is that you might as well uh, uh, refer to this office as the Prime Minister's office. Mm -hmm. um, when we go regionally, uh, the terminology Prime Cabinet Secretary uh, sounds different. Right. Uh, and uh, whether you're looking at Uganda or you're looking at Tanzania, for instance, and even many other countries. So they tend to say, why don't you just simplify the nomenclature? <laughs> and refer to it as uh, the, the Prime, Prime Minister. Minister's office. But there has been conversations mm -hmm. that this is actually introducing the office of the Prime Minister through an illegal route. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the National Dialogue Committee report, mm -hmm. essentially they are talking about entrenching it in the con into the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Is there some irregularity here or an illegality committed? No, no, no illegality was committed. Uh, because as it stands, I am a Cabinet uh, <coughs> Secretary and uh, the president can then assign you different roles. Uh, and I went through the process of vetting uh, in parliament. So we crossed that bridge uh, way back. If national dialogue and it's both sides of the divide that are coming out to agree that it needs to be entrenched into the constitution, is it an admission that there's some irregularity there? No, it's not necessarily an admission that there's an irregularity. There's no irregularity. I think uh, we, it's, it's, uh, society has got to be dynamic. Um, and as we go into the future, okay, there's the whole debate about inclusivity uh, of uh, Kenyans and regions in terms of the leadership of a nation. Yes. All right? So the debate that... Uh, 
is still alive and continues is that uh, do we feel or do Kenyans feel that the executive is too narrow, all right? Uh, and therefore, the debate has been uh, why not uh, introduce and formalize, okay, the whole aspect of uh, the office of a prime minister, okay? okay? Now, it's, it's the same principle now also plays out in the question of the opposition, right? That is why now there's a debate that, uh, uh, and recommendations are quite clear, nobody is really against it, that uh, perhaps Kenyans made a mistake mm -hmm. in actually uh, trying to do away with the, the office of the leader of opposition. And now that debate is back with us. This is interesting because I remember not so long ago, mm -hmm. there was the Building Bridges Initiative that you actually appended your signature in support. Mm -hmm. Then it appears quite consistent in terms of establishment of those offices. Mm -hmm. But there has also been concerns about your relationship with uh, the presidency, specifically with the deputy president, Tugadi Gashagwa, a perception that you two might be competing. At the start of President William Ruto's term, there's a time that uh, a lot of responsibilities were heaped on you, especially on representing the president outside the, of this country. How do you respond to that for people that feel there's actually some bit of hostility? First of all, I'll, I'll take to two issues. The first one you refer to the BBI, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, the BBI process was mishandled. For instance, you remember in the BBI, there was an attempt okay to stifle the independence of the judiciary right we keep on forgetting that that was embedded there you'll remember there was an attempt to try and get rid of the structures around the security network mm -hmm. so that you do away with the police service commission you do away with certain things and then you vest that in a minister mm -hmm. uh, why are kenyans forgetting that those are the examples of the things wrong. that were wrong right. in the BBI, mm -hmm. all right? The principle about the broad changes and in whatever, maybe it was not an, uh, uh, but there were very specific issues that were obnoxious. Now, the other one, it's really, uh, for me, it is uh, uh, trying to create something where there's none trying to create a conflict where there is that. We are barely one year in office. The executive order is very specific that my role is to assist the president and the deputy president. And uh, some, I've been in public space for a very long time in terms of my experience, okay? So I know what the role of a deputy president is I know what the role of a president is, and I know how to manage mm. uh, my role as the prime cabinet secretary. Right. So the issue of there was conflict or there was competition is neither here nor but, there. But you've, you've heard of the speculation? Uh, yes, but, and I've ignored it. Okay. I'm responding to it for the first time through you. Right. But as far as I'm concerned, it was a non-issue. It doesn't exist. So how do you take instructions um, to assist the president or the deputy? Where do you get those instructions from? Uh, well, uh, the, sometimes the instructions can be verbal, sometimes they can be written. From, from uh, who? The president. How if, 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 if the president wants to give me direction, he can call and say, I want you to do uh, a certain thing for me. Have you received instructions from the deputy president to assist? Of course. Of course, he has. He has asked me to handle certain meetings on his behalf or to get certain engagements carried out on his behalf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At a time that you are transitioning to now holding the position of Prime Cabinet Secretary and uh, CS for Foreign Affairs and Diaspora Affairs, there was a bit of miscommunication, or was it a tiff? I don't know what you call it, uh, between yourself and the, tri I mean, the Public Service Minister now, uh, Moses Kuria. What was that about? Uh, actually, I don't know. You didn't see the communication that came from your office, your official, former official, Kibisu Kabatesi? That I saw later, but it's neither here nor there now. It's behind us. Uh, so there was no tiff. CS Courier responded to the media and said that um, 
he had been assigned, of course we saw the publication, uh, the statement from the chief of staff, that his office was to be domiciled here, uh, that you speak from. But then he said you requested to stay here. This military was supposed to be headquartered at the, the old radio headquarters. The Prime Cabinet Secretary has requested that uh, I, I leave that space to him. I don't know how much of that is accurate, but also the reasoning behind it. Well, you know, the station or the position of an office or where it is domiciled or headquarters is communicated through a gazette notice. An executive order is a gazette notice signed off by the president. Okay, it's an elevated gazette notice. That is why it's called an executive order. Now, when this debate was raging, uh, Sam, was there a gazettement? There was no communication there from was the no. chief of staff. So you respond to the executive order, and the executive order clarified, and now you have it with you, and the position is clear. So it's no longer an issue. So it came way later. The reason I'm asking this, because you are state officer, so is a CS courier, and also I believe the chief of uh, staff. But let me ask you, Sam, of yeah. what value is that question? What I'm asking is uh, what exactly was happening, because this is one government. It came out as if there is a fight, but you're saying there no, was not. there was not. Yeah, that's why I'm telling you of what value is it. The CS said that you requested to stay here, and the question is, no. traditionally, just a moment, uh -huh. traditionally the Office of Foreign Affairs has always been at the old treasury. Now the Office of the PCS was here, so I'm just wondering why was it not possible in the first communication to have either the office move here, the Office of the Foreign Affairs, or have the Office of PCS move to Foreign Affairs? You see, you're forgetting that first and foremost I'm um, PCS. Right. The office of the PCS is here. All right? Right. The, at that time, the domicile of foreign affairs was on the other. So he was not taking over the role of PCS, was he? Yeah. So can we then close that debate? I want to close it, but oh, yeah. uh, shortly after, when the executive order came mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. um, the roles, uh, that is the one on uh, st state corporations, inspectorate and state corporations advisory committee, they had been under your office. But now they were to move, or the CS said they were to move to the public service because they had that role of uh, coordinating no, a few that things. Is, that is why I'm telling you you're wrong. We were waiting for the executive order. All right? When the executive order came out, where did those roles go? They went to the presidency. Absolutely. To the office of the president. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm trying to say is that you don't jump the gun. When there's a communication of that nature, what you do is you wait for the executive order so that it brings clarity to the issues. And that is what we were doing. So the statement where the chief of staff should have been ignored or what? He made a statement. He said that changes have been made. But equally, there's correspondence where he said further clarification is to follow. Okay, but that did not necessarily come out in the media, but it's there. Interesting. So, how do you maintain the office of Prime Cabinet Secretary and CS Foreign Affairs here, while some of your staff are still at the old Treasury? Do you have an office there, first of all? Let me tell you. Yeah. Many government departments have a shortage of space. Even when Foreign Affairs uh, Minister was sitting there, there's a whole department at Upper Hill. Yes, Affairs. Isn't it? Right. What, what is the building called? 360? Uh, 360 degrees, I think. At 316. Mm -hmm. Is there still the Office of Cabinet Secretary Foreign Affairs at the old Treasury building? Yes, there's an office there and people are using it. The building is full. Have you been there? No, I'm asking, a speci is there uh, a, a yes, specific office a, for the CS yes, Foreign Affairs? Yes, there's an office there, and I can have some meetings there. There's absolutely nothing wrong in me having some meetings there. And but this a, is where I sit. And with a shortage of offices, don't you the, think it would be prudent way, to... Don't you know we are accommodating people here in foreign affairs? There are also others who could not get space there, and they're here. 
that's what I'm asking. In the spirit of austerity measures, why have an office here but another office in a different because building? Because when you have over 1,400 people, Mr. Sam Gituku, they will not fit in one place. I think we're not understanding each other. I'm talking about the uh, you, office you, of cabinet secretary. You're talking of austerity measures. Yes. And I'm trying to tell you, already we are squeezed with space. Right now, as we sit here, we are accommodating the inspectorate. We are accommodating GDS in this mm -hmm. building. GDS, uh, you mean government uh, delivery, delivery services? services. Okay. I was being accommodated in Treasury mm -hmm. on the 10th floor mm -hmm. because there's a shortage of space. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a plan for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to have a completely new building put up so that it can take care of its officers. Okay. Do, do you have you identified what that would be? The, it's being worked on. When to the, construct when or to buy? To construct. Okay. Yeah. Let's get to the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. as a docket. First of all, why did the president pick on you? I suppose it's the experience uh -huh. uh, that uh, I carry on my shoulders. Um, I've been in the public space for some time uh, and uh, he had confidence that my engagement would add value to Kenya's uh, diplomatic uh, agenda. Why, why do you think it was ne necessary to do the reshuffle and change uh, in that docket? The president can do a reshuffle at any one time. Okay. Let us, uh, because if you are to ask why was it necessary to do the reshuffle? That is a question that the president should answer, not but, me. But, but you would know because he would give you specific no, instructions no, 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 on what no. he but, wants to handle. But uh, I, I told you one thing earlier, that I've been in public space for some time. Yeah. All right? So you know when to speak what. Okay? Mm -hmm. And how you speak to certain things. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that is why I'm sitting here as the Minister for Foreign Affairs, right. other than being the PCS. Because the message I'm trying to tell you is this, that the President will from time to time make decisions and reorganize his government as he deems fit. All right? And if he consults, it is his prerogative to consult. Okay? But we must now also get out of this notion that if you have consulted with the president, you rush out and you tell people, I have consulted with the president. There are some things that you consult, and you consult in confidence. You, you, you're, you're saying something interesting. Yes, I am. Um, so that, that was a problem before you came in? Uh, what was a problem? Consulting and speaking out. Before. No, con consulting and sp in confidence is important, yeah? And there are issues. This is why we are diplomats. This is why we're in public space. There are aspects that you consult, and there are those that will be consumed at different levels mm -hmm. or communicated at different times. So that is the whole essence of being in public space, yes. yeah? You still don't answer my question. Mm. Um, why it was necessary? You say the president has the prerogative. Indeed, he has. But from what you've seen, for the time you've been at the ministry, um, what did you say are the areas that you needed to fix as a matter of urgency as you start your tenure as CS Foreign Affairs? As I said, the president thought, in my view, that uh, I would add value to his diplomatic engagements. Let's, let's take, for instance, He's pursuing an aggressive agenda mm -hmm. on economic diplomacy. That is one thing he's pursuing. Issues of how do we get more foreign direct investment, how do we step up our investments and so forth. Now, obviously, my background at the Treasury lends a lot of weight to the agenda that he wants to pursue. So that is an example I can give you. Okay. Interesting. So a few weeks ago, 
or is, no, actually, by the time the reshuffle was happening, uh, there was uh, the list of high commissioners and ambassadors that uh, were nominated by the president, now appointed. Um, what is now the new direction? Because when you looked at that list, a few of those nominees, uh, uh, career, career persons, others are political leaders. What is changing in terms of these deployments and what is the agenda? foreign policy for Kenya? I think what is important is that uh, there's no harm in blending public appointments. Um, when we look at aspects of diplomacy or even when we look at how government needs to infuse new thinking and new approaches, you have to have a blend. You have the career uh, uh, diplomats and then there's no harm in, in infusing uh, some different kind of approach and thinking mm -hmm. into our diplomacy by engaging people who may have political experience or may have business experience to come and be part of uh, the team. Now it's a question of what should be the ratio. Now that is debatable. Would it be a 50-50 ratio of career diplomats and those who uh, are coming in from different sectors of uh, uh, the country? Or would it be a 60-40 uh, ratio, so that becomes a debatable issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think the infusion is necessary, and it is important that if you want to have uh, a country that is moving forward, uh, a civil service that is dynamic and so forth, you must respect the career people, but you must also make sure that it does not become incestuous. Okay. You must infuse some new thinking. And that was the first nomination and appointment of ambassadors and high commissioners by the current president. Is that it or more coming? Because you still have a lot of ambassadors have, and high commissioners. We have, we, have, have, we have engagements in many countries. So we must anticipate that uh, changes will, because you, um, some of them uh, have their terms still running. Okay, so it's transition. Yeah, you don't guillotine in, in certain circumstances. You don't just guillotine. By the way, the other day I was talking to I was at the, uh, the Judiciary uh, Forum when they were launching their annual report on the stage, and I said uh, the, the, the strategic uh, uh, document of engagement, access to justice. And I raised one issue that when a government is changing, we go to Kasarani. When we go to Kasarani, we actually go there because it's the ceremony contemplated in the Constitution. Okay? And there's an act, a very thin act, which they say assumption to office, office yes. act. Mm. But when you look at that act, it is concentrated on the ceremony. Now, as we look at the government agenda, what is our experience? Our experience is that there is no transition of executive authority law. There's a vacuum. So you think we need that law? Yes, we need to. Because at what stage does a minister Cease to hold office. Cease to hold office. Have you prescribed what he should do as he exits? Does he prepare any handover notes? Does he uh, give a list of uh, a schedule of the assets, an inventory of the assets, the critical assets of the ministry? All these things are blank. And that is interesting because... Um, and the same, the same holds for the principal secretaries. Right. All right. So this is why I'm saying transition is not about a guillotine. We need to be very careful and organize in the way we manage this. Let me give you an example, another example. That's why this thing is, a, is more serious than you imagine. We went to the elections. The law says that the chairman of the Electoral Commission shall gazette or sign off for gazettement the results and the winner 
of that election. Some, you'll be shocked to know that after Chebukati gazetted President William Ruto as the winner, somebody within the government printer was hesitating to gazette those results. The argument being that he was waiting for orders from above. From who? That's the question. That's the question. If the law is clear, then why would somebody who is supposed to gazette the results be seeking consent from another source? And yet, it is so clear that the chair of the Electoral Commission has gazetted. Who clears that? Now, these are the issues that we say under the transition of executive authority, we must bring clarity. Did you notice, out of surprise, uh, that there were Gazette notices coming out, appointing people way after the president had been thrown in. What appointments? Public appointment. To what offices? Yes. What offices? Public office. Give an example. Parastatals. Like what parastatals? Oh, just go back to that. Go back and you'll see the Gazette notices. When was the president thrown in? 13th September 2022. Yes. You find Gazette notices appointing people uh, at the end of September and in October. And what was the explanation? That is the question. So the transition of executive authority bill must be able to have clarity and bring order to this kind of thing. You, you know, PCS, you raised that issue at a time that there has been conversation about um, shifting of the authority of the, or the, the working of the government printer. And I don't know how much is true uh, that it has moved to State House. What's going on? The government printer's uh, role has always been in the office of the president. Yeah. So to me, that has not shifted. Still at, under that office? Yes. You, you check the history. So, so, the, so the government printer is always within the office of the president. So do they take instructions from anyone in terms of, of practice? Of, of course, in, in terms of practice, the law guides the gazettement. So if the law says uh, so-and-so should gazette, it's that person who should gazette. He's, by, the gazette should reflect the signature of that person. It doesn't require the government printer to apply their mind, the gazette or they receive? No, no, the government printer should not vary. She cannot vary okay. the, the, the instructions. The, the instructions. Okay. On the question of uh, nominations and appointments to various missions, what is your thinking about if you had to move an ambassador from one station to another being done by a new president? Do they just move or do they need to be vetted? Uh, if he has gone through the vetting and he's a serving ambassador, uh, he has done his bit, he's already been vetted, okay? So if the president is extending... Uh, no, in this case you have a new president. Yes. But like you he, have today. Yes, but if he feels, in, okay, it may, may sound a gray area, but if he feels that a sitting ambassador who has already gone through the vetting is qualified and competent, to handle another station, that is the lateral transfer, I don't think is, is in breach of the law. Don't you think that's a, an inconsistency? Because previously, there's actually a, a, a high court decision by saying that prime cabinet secretaries, sorry, cabinet secretaries transitioning, even if it's from the first term to the second term of the same president, every appointment must come with vetting. In fact, your colleague in cabinet, Simon Chelugui, was a cabinet secretary. He was appointed and vetted afresh. Shouldn't the same apply to serving ambassadors who are being appointed by a new president? It's, uh, I say it's a gray area because, you see, with the cabinet uh, level, it's at a different uh, status, okay? What with does that, that mean? Uh, it, is, it is at a different level, okay? Uh, because the cabinet is the highest uh, organ, okay? And it is normally deemed, okay, that when a new president takes over, cabinet ceases. That cabinet ceases. Mm -hmm. 
but ambassadors do not cease. And PSAs do not cease. There is, there is a transition. Question. Yeah. PS Hinga had been serving as PS in President Kenyatta's government. Come President Ruto, he's appointed to a different, actually the same department. He was vetted. Don't you think he should apply to all appointments by the president that require <laughs> vetting? You see, that's what I'm saying. It may be a gray area, OK? It may be a gray area. But in the case of the diplomats, the way I look at it, this particular diplomat may not have been vetted because he has already gone through the process and therefore an assignment okay. to another station does not call for him to be, to be back. But when you're looking at the ministries, the ministers tend to reorg the president tends to reorganize the ministries. He doesn't call them by the same name. Very rare. That's interesting, but as you said, there's a gray area there.